A mother's quest to find the truth in her son's death leads her on her own investigation. Next on One Detective. What you, what you want? What you, what you want? On September 25, 2007, in the small town of Salverton, Pennsylvania, the local police department is dispatched to 138 Franklin Avenue for an unconscious subject. According to the police report, when EMS arrived on the scene, they found Raymond Zachary half under a pickup truck. He was unresponsive and cool to the touch. Later that afternoon, in her Florida home, Shirley Sansovino receives a telephone call from her daughter-in-law, Darlene Zachary. It's a phone call that no mother should ever receive. And then around 2.30, um, I had a call from my daughter-in-law. And she was asking if my husband was home. And I said, no, um, he's at the doctor's office. Well, when will he be back? And I said, I don't know. So she kept hemming and hawing. I asked her if there was something wrong. And she said, yes. And I said, what is it? And she said, well, it's about Ray. And I said, well, what about Ray? And she said, well, he collapsed today. I said, well, where is he? Is he at the doctor? Is he uh, all right? Is he in the hospital? And she said, no. I said, darling, tell me what's going on. What is this? And she kept hemming and hawing and, and, and whatever. And I finally she said, uh, I said, well, where is he? Um, tell me he, that he, where he is. She said, uh, I, I can't. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, he died. He's dead. With her bags packed, Shirley Sansovino and her husband begin their 1,000-mile trip from Inverness, Florida to Southerton, Pennsylvania. While traveling north on 995, Shirley Sansovino begins making a series of telephone calls to her daughter-in-law, Darlene Zachary. And during these phone calls, she realizes that Darlene isn't quite being forthright. In fact, she's being a little standoffish and hasn't told her anything about the events leading up to Ray's death. During these phone calls, Lisa Warnke, a friend of Darlene, steps in and announces that she's now the family spokesperson. She also reveals that it's their intent to have Ray's remains cremated. Knowing that Ray wanted a Christian burial, Shirley has her first clue. And she was saying, well, you do know your son wanted to be cremated. And I said, no, I, I don't believe that. And I said, I am so sure he never said he wanted to be cremated that I'll bet you he has no will. And she said, oh, I never thought about it, that, and was gone. And that was my last conversation with her, but I kept. As Shirley Sansovino traveled north, Ray's body was transported to the Montgomery County, Pennsylvania coroner's office. But with the elected coroner dead and a nurse filling in as the interim coroner, Ray's autopsy was completed. His death was ruled natural causes from a cardiac arrest. It was during the viewing that Shirley's suspicions were heightened. Not only did her daughter-in-law not speak with her, but when Shirley and other members of the family approached the casket with Ray's body, they developed an inkling that something was very wrong. The first inkling we had was at the funeral. We, and we saw the bruises on Ray's face, and his nose was off center with a bruise on the side of it. Um, people that had come with us, uh, friends, all made the same remark, you know, something doesn't look right here. In the days following Ray's death, Shirley Sansovino begins her own investigation. And it's through the course of her investigation that she establishes a timeline. Shirley learns that at 11.45 a.m., Darlene has her last telephone conversation with Ray. At 11.49 a.m., a neighbor passing by finds Ray unconscious, slumped over the front seat of his truck and calls 911. Police arrive on the scene at 1150 and find Ray dead. They then request the coroner who arrives and pronounces Ray dead at 1220 p.m. The problem with this is that later in the autopsy report, 
it indicates that Ray had had a telephone conversation 15 minutes prior to him being pronounced dead. But it doesn't indicate who Ray had had that conversation with. According to the coroner's report, they were there at 1220. So if you go back to the timeline, um, the phone call could not have happened from, from Darlene at 1145. If it rang five minutes later, the police officer would have been there and heard the phone ring. The coroner's report said he was pronounced dead at 12.20, and they took him away. But on the coroner's report, it said someone had talked to him 15 minutes prior to. And that doesn't work out. In December of 2007, Shirley discovers that a will has now been filed with the Montgomery County, Pennsylvania Register of Wills. She and her daughter request a copy of that will, and when they receive an electronic copy by email, they discover something quite unusual. So my daughter was able to get a copy of it and emailed it to me. And in the process of emailing it, it enlarged on her screen well, she could see under the signature there was a, another signature. So when I got it and was able to print it and look at it, and I thought it, it looked so unusual, so much like his signature, but not exactly, until we began to examine it more carefully to see that there was this shadow underneath of the heavy writing. Um, and I asked a neighbor who was a prosecutor what could I do to uh, clarify why the will was there, how it got these other signatures. There were so many questions I had, and he suggested I go to a document examiner. And there was one close by in Hudson, Florida. Uh, we emailed it to him, and he said, email would be the best for him to look at it. So I emailed it to him, and he sent back a report saying that he thought it was a tracing, and from the appearance of it, it looked like there was not an original signature on the will. My daughter and I went to the Register of Wills in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, and looked at the will. And it was obvious to me to see that it just looked manipulated. It just didn't look real. There were lines where there should have been Ray's initial. There was nothing but all the witnesses signed on their little lines. Each page was, there's no connection. Like I know in Maryland, they make you sign your name on each of the pages to be sure that it's the same page it belongs to and date it that belongs to the final signature page. The signature page was folded. The others were not. So there's a lot of discrepancies there. But it, nevertheless, we got copies and let it be. Um, and while we were visiting here is when I got a call from New York Life Insurance Company wanting to get in touch with me. Um, they wanted to know if I was aware that I was the probable beneficiary of a life insurance policy, and I said, no, I, I didn't. So we went back home, and sure enough, within a day or two, there was a FedEx package, and I was being sued by New York Life Insurance Company in Philadelphia Federal Court. Uh, I was being sued, Darlene, the current wife, was being sued, and Janet, the former wife, was being sued all because the policy had been with Janet, the first wife, as beneficiary. I was a secondary beneficiary. But Darlene, the recent widow, had sent a letter to New York Life Insurance Company demanding they give her the proceeds immediately or she would file a suit against them and also take sanctions for them not responding to her. In her search for handwriting samples to compare against the will at question, Shirley recalled that her son had become employed with Virtus Communications in March of 2007. It was during that time that he had signed a non-competition agreement in his pre-employment package. Through the subpoena process, Shirley was able to get a hold of those original documents and to forward them to a handwriting expert. From there, she discovers new information. 
that was a document Ray signed for Burtis Communications as part of his pre-employment packet. It was a non-competition -com agreement that he wouldn't go tell their secret somewhere else. Um, he signed the first one on May, uh, March 2nd and sent it. Then they had him to redo another one on March 9, and that one is the one where he wrote everything out. The other one had a, uh, he printed his name. Uh, that when we subpoenaed the pre-employment packet, that was part of that packet, and as soon as I saw that document, I realized there it is. So we called the document examiner who had already looked at the will in October, and he asked her to go back and have another look at this document, how it compares to the will. It seems so much like it. So she did, and um, wrote back an email that said, bingo, you found the source document. And the, uh, the New York Life letter saying Ray changed his beneficiary to uh, his new wife in July, plus the will, plus this, then made a complete set of three signatures that were identical. Handwriting experts analyzed the three documents. They included the will, the letter sent to New York Life, and the non-competition agreement from Virtus Communications. When these three documents were converted into transparencies and laid over one another, you can clearly see that the signatures are exactly the same. The will was the first important document obtained through the subpoena process. The second, the autopsy report. And when Shirley received her copy of the autopsy report, she learned that there hadn't been one, but two independent toxicology exams conducted on the blood sample from her son's autopsy. What's astonishing is the results that were revealed in those reports. The first lab indicates that barium was found in Ray's body at the level of 1,950 micrograms per liter, certainly a lethal dose. However, the second toxicology report indicates a level of 41 micrograms per liter, significantly smaller than the first number. Experts tell us this is the beginning stages of a lethal dose. Wanting to understand more about barium and how it affects the human body, Shirley reached out to an expert, senior toxicologist, Dr. Woody Hartgrove. Well, Shirley contacted me and, uh, in uh, the fall, and a very few days after uh, we talked, she sent me copies of all the, the documents that she had. And the first thing that drew my attention was that there were two reports for uh, the element barium. And the strange thing was that in the first report, that where the work was done at NMS Laboratories in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, that uh, someone had scratched on the report that it was a false positive. Now the number, the value that was reported was 1,950 micrograms per liter of barium in his blood. And that, that much barium would certainly have caused the symptoms that we described earlier, the uh, cardiac symptoms. But the strange thing is, is that uh, there was a note scratched onto this report, and it's not uh, dated or signed by who wrote the note, but they claim they had had a discussion with the laboratory director uh, of uh, NMS Laboratories and he told them that it was a false positive. Now, the next sample, I'm, it, 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 so it couldn't have been the same sample, was done at uh, another laboratory a few weeks later, and that, in that case, they got a value of 41. But I know 41 micrograms per liter, but I don't know anything about how, that, how they decided to send that second batch, nor where it came from. It certainly wasn't first. But this, my comment on this is that this is particularly bad practice. Most contract laboratories that do this kind of work would have recalled that report. They certainly wouldn't have just told somebody that it's a false positive. They, they would have recalled all the copies, destroyed those, and reissued another report with the proper value if they had good reason for claiming that it was a false positive. And how does barium affect the human body? Dr. Hartgrove explains. Barium is a, is a heavy metal, and it's a toxic 
by definition of the EPA, of being uh, very toxic. It's in the order of 10 to 100 milligrams per kilogram toxic to human beings. The toxicity is mostly expressed as, a, as cardiac uh, toxicity, heart toxicity. It causes the uh, uh, calcium that's normal, normally used to uh, help conduct nerve impulses in the heart to be disrupted. And so barium would be replacing calcium, and so you would get uh, heart uh, fibrillation. In other words, it beat very fast. And that's primarily the uh, toxicity of, of, of barium. It, there are other uh, uh, symptoms that you would see if, if you, in other words, if, if someone is intoxicated, and those would include um, intense weakness because of the fact the muscles are failing, uh, difficulty breathing because the respiratory muscles would also be affected. Uh, after a while, you'd sev have severe abdominal pain and some anxiety. Uh, the tachycardia, in other words, the, the, the rapid heartbeat would kick in very quickly, and then eventually uh, you would have paralysis and then death. So how does the autopsy report weigh against the level of barium found in Ray's system? Well, I want to first say that I don't think there's any real uh, drastic inconsistencies uh, in, in, as regards to this. Uh, what's described here on, as, as cause of death is cardiac dysrhythmia due to interstitial myocardial fibrosis. Now, that will indeed lead to a cardiac uh, event such as what was induced, which can be induced by barium at high levels. Uh, it, it, it would be indistinguishable, I mean, because if, if you're intoxicated with barium or whether you just chronically have this condition of interstitial myocardial fibrosis. In her own research, Shirley Sanservino finds the second edition of Randall C. Basselt's Disposition of Toxic Drug and Chemicals in Man. According to that text, there was a non-fatal case of barium poisoning where the subject had 26 micrograms per liter in his body. It was during the New York life litigation that had been filed against Shirley, the first wife of Ray, and Arlene, that it came to light to the court that the will had been forged. In fact, experts in the field had testified that it was statistically impossible for three exact duplicate signatures to be replicated by the same person. Therefore, it had been determined that the will was fraudulent. From that, the court issued an order that the Attorney General's office now investigate the case. And it's from their investigation that indictments were issued for Darlene Zachary, Lisa Wernicke, and two other accomplices who were involved in this fraud. And the insurance fraud is handled rather strictly in Pennsylvania through the Attorney General's office. And I was contacted one day by this agent who wanted to talk to me about this case. And from there, he came down to my house and went through two and a half hours, went through my documents and looked at my files. And he said, I see more here than just an insurance fraud case. Shirley's hope was to have her son's death thoroughly investigated, but when she felt she wasn't getting any justice, she took matters into her own hands and started her own investigation. It was through the subpoena process that she was able to derive all the information that we've revealed here today and bring us to where we are. You can find out more about her process through her website at denyjustice.com. And you'll learn more about how a grieving mother has been affected by her son's death on her blog at justiceforraymond.wordpress.com. Uh, most of the efforts that I tried to get assistance to get information or get out a story, get someone interested in, in writing something, just met with silence because it seemed to be so overwhelming that they couldn't grasp it. And then... Um, I started a website to put all the documents out as they began to happen. It was something I felt the public needed to know. And I know how much trouble I had finding information as I began researching. And then I started a blog where I could talk to people and have some uh, back and forth to other people who had suffered such things and had experience like ours. And, Mainly I was asking if anybody who lived in Souderton, Pennsylvania knew of anyone else that had symptoms like Ray, if they would let me know or let the authorities know. And as yet, 
in a year's time, we've heard nothing back from that area. Shirley's investigation has certainly uncovered a lot of information, but there are questions that remain unanswered. For example, the phone call that was supposed to have occurred 15 minutes prior to Ray being pronounced dead. What about the bruises on Ray's face that were seen during his viewing? Ray wanted a Christian burial, but was cremated. How did the barium get into his system? Why are there two differing toxicology reports? And lastly, what exactly was the intent in forging the will? Until these questions are answered, Shirley will continue her quest. And she has but one last task. I just want the truth. I want to know what happened to Ray. And if there's been a mistake, if someone didn't do something they should have done, just go on from there. And let's look at all these reports objectively and find the truth. To find out more about my true crime books, visit my website at kenlangstudios.com. I'm Ken Lang, and this is One Detective. What you, what you want, what you, what you want.